Hey guys, we're back on for the last session of the day. Yeah, and it's a good one. Um, so as you mentioned previously, we are going to be talking about, um, well, not us, but uh, <laughs> the talk is going to be about uh, flexible Selenium automation framework. This is a really interesting one. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, Selenium is for um, UI, UI tests. Um, and it's something that's really helpful and really important in all kinds of development that we do. So um, for this, we are going to bring in Lovelish Biari. Actually, let's uh, let's let him let's talk him a in. bit more. About, yeah. yeah. Hello, Lovelish. Hey. Hello. Hello, Hello, everyone. Happy to right. have you with us. How are you doing? Uh, I'm doing fine. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's also, a pleasure to have you on. And Thank it's you. a really nice topic that you chose. Huh? I'm, I'm personally <laughs> looking forward to it. I'm going to follow this closely. <laughs> I, I did not use Selenium before, but I always I looked at it um, recently, actually. was planning on looking into how to integrate it into my, um, you know, my development pipeline. Uh, ah, okay. So you've been, you've been checking out some sessions uh, this morning. <laughs> how are you yes, feeling about, actually, about this one? Um, <laughs> I will be able to comment on this at the end, I guess. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. We, we, we are cool here. We are all casually relaxed and <laughs> we are having fun. So, nice. um, you know, we are just going to leave the floor to you uh, where you can okay. take up your session. For the viewers, so, okay. don't forget, comments, feedback, questions in the chat. Uh, we are here. We are here with you in, in the chat, actually. Send, send yeah. us a hi. No one's talking to us. We're <laughs> scared of us. <laughs> All right. Okay, All right. All right. Yeah. The floor Let's is go. yours. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, like I, like uh, we said, actually today I'll talk about Selenium and how we can build an automation framework out of Selenium. So to start with, I will give you a, a little uh, brief about myself. So I am uh, Lavlesh Bihari. I work at uh, Ikea in the NFT team, which is a non-functional testing team. I'm a test automation engineer. I have around 11 years of experience in the software testing field in different companies across Mauritius. I'm experienced in uh, manual automation and performance tests. And last year, actually, we started um, a local chapter for ice 2 for Mauritius, and I'm the founder and the current president for that local chapter. So I'm passionate about testing and automation, so this is what we'll be, we'll be talking today about. All right, so to get started, <coughs> just a few realizations actually about uh, how the world is evolving. We have software all around us. We have software being developed every day, every minute actually, mobile apps, etc. Everything is being developed uh, concurrently and uh, in mass. So all these potential, um, all the potential actually stored in those software and the potential for the testing team as well uh, is very is very very large in terms of effort in terms of uh, estimate in terms of budget as well so just imagine that all these testing actually we could leverage some of them some of those testing effort into automation so it's a huge uh, market as well for automation testing so to start with i will clear some misconception that um, we have currently uh, across the market on automation testing all right so some common misconception um, across different uh, public talks that I've, I've uh, given um, in different locations in Mauritius. After the talk, there are some people who, who, who we meet, who we come across during networking, etc. So their concern actually about automation is its high development cost. Indeed, automation has a development cost. It is uh, high at the start. But uh, if we have the right design and the right uh, uh, skill set to develop uh, a good automation framework, actually decreases over time. So the cost of maintenance and development actually decreases over time. It's not high all the time. So that's a, a major misconception that we have uh, across the market. Also, automation testing actually is thought not to, not to give so, um, as expected gain from, from it. This is also dependent on the design. If an automation framework is designed um, following the, the, the guidelines actually that is recommended, the gain is quite, is quite significant. For example, at Ikea, I can say that we measured the, the gain uh, um, 
through our automation test, the framework that we have, etc., benchmark it with uh, the manual test team. We came across like uh, a gain of 50% in terms of effort. So uh, let's say a test team would take uh, like an hour to test a feature. Uh, the same would be done with within 30 minutes uh, through automation. And more checks as well is being done through automation, uh, automation testing that might be missed out by the manual tester. So that's uh, another mis misconception that should be cleared. Automation testing is meant only for developers. That's not true as well. Actually, for developers, um, in indeed, automation test is actually a technical, uh, a technical work. Actually, it requires some programming skill. But the mindset of a QA is very important in automation testing. Um, I can summarize this actually uh, with, uh, with a sentence that actually uh, crop up quite, quite often. For a developer, actually, the software is working unless proved otherwise. But for a QA, the mindset is different. The software is not working unless proved otherwise. And this is this play actually a very important role in uh, designing uh, the right automation framework. Uh, so that's a misconception, mis misconception as well, that automation testing is only meant for developers. They can participate, they can help actually in building the framework, but it's not only meant for them. In line with, uh, with the last point, actually, manual tester are not able to contribute to automation testing. If the work is technical require, requiring uh, uh, programming skills, then manual tester with limited uh, uh, skills will not be able to contribute. But with the right design, uh, like the one that we have, we have implemented at IKEA, manual test team actually develop and, uh, and execute their own test. So they are able to, to write their test and they are able to execute it as well um, without, the, without being, uh, being involved in the coding process. So that's uh, also dependent on the design. And uh, above all, one misconception that sticks around with automation testing is that uh, the expectation is we click on one button and all tests will be done. Uh, that's true at the end, but to reach that point, actually there's a lot of effort. There is also lots of, lots of, uh, of trial and error that, uh, that need to be done. And also um, we have to follow all the guidelines for building a good automation framework. So that's about the uh, common misconception on automation testing. I will be discussing also uh, on what is actually an automation framework, okay? And also different types of automation framework that we have uh, theoretically and how it's implemented uh, in real life. So automation framework, well, this is a very simplistic diagram. What we have is actually we have an underlying technology automation engine. For example, in, in my case, it, it is Selenium, okay, the Selenium engine. That's um, the underlying technology. I have object identifiers, for example, ID, uh, uh, class name, XPath, all those items that actually identify object on the web page. The web page is actually behind the web page is actually uh, DOM, okay. It's, uh, it's a data structure, which, which is a tree data structure. So we have to traverse that uh, document object model to find the right object we want to interact with. So that's uh, described in the object identifier. And we also have the test data. The test data is important as well because it actually channel our testing. For example, entering a username, entering a password, all these, the username, the password, actually the test data, the object identifier would be the, the XPath or the ID, the class name of the text box, where the username and the password would be, would be entered. And a framework has, a, has a, um, another module called automation test control. What it will do, it will actually make sure that there is a, a synergy between all these elements to communicate to channel the test, to control the test, and at the end, provide a report for the test. So that's basically a, a simplistic description about what is an automation framework. So we have three types of, uh, actually three types uh, of automation framework that we will be discussing today. There are others, there are hybrid automation framework and also behavioral, uh, behavior driven automation framework. But we'll stick to these three because these are the, the actually the main ones, I would say. <clears throat> so let's consider we have a web page um, that requires a username and a password, a sign-in button. So 
one way to automate, to start automating that part would be um, to have uh, the underlying engine find the text box by using one attribute, what object identifier called name, and that's the username, okay? That's the, use, that's the name of the text box, and to send a key, for example, Lovelish, okay, onto that text box, and the same for the password, and click on sign in. You would see that the object identifier and the test data are both inside the script. So uh, this script actually is a map, is a mapping of the, the UI. Uh, so this is why we call it page pattern, because it's the pattern of the page. And uh, also with this, actually the, the greater, the, greater the, um, the size of the product we want to test is, the more classes we'll have, the more would be the, the automation script in terms of coding, in terms of line code. So these two are actually proportional. That's about page pattern automation framework. The next one is data-driven automation framework. In this one, what we, tr we try to do is to externalize the test data. The aim of doing this is actually to have control on the test data so that um, someone with, uh, with limited programming skills could still maintain those test data without having to dive into the codes. So that's also a good approach. We could, we could externalize the, the test data into an Excel or a text file or an XML file. It doesn't matter, but uh, that's the concept. Is The concept is actually to separate the test data and the script. That's uh, data-driven. And the last one that we'll be discussing is the keyword-driven automation framework. In this one, we actually separate the test data, the identifier, and the action. For example, on a web page, what we could do uh, are, called, are called actions or interactions. Uh, for example, we could enter text, we could uh, enter text in a text box, we could click on a button, we could drag and drop, we could double click, we could uh, also do right click. All these are interactions with the web page. Instead of coding uh, the framework in a way that would, uh, uh, that would be based on the on the data or on the page, page pattern, we would actually code the actions itself. We could reuse those actions multiple times for different scenarios. For example, a click on a sign in button would be the same on it on would be the same interaction for a click on a logout button. That's the aim behind is to reuse those actions over and over again and sequence them in a way so that uh, they become a test case. So we'll stick with the keyword-driven automation framework because this is where we have the highest flexibility in terms of maintenance, in terms of, uh, of upgrade as well to the framework. So <clears throat> what are the guidelines actually to build a robust and flexible automation framework? These guidelines are based on some research I've done and uh, my, my experience in automation, actually there are a few things that we've implemented uh, with success at Ikea, and I will be sharing those with you in this part. So to start with, a modular framework. All right, so the framework in itself is quite complex to build, but the work becomes easier if we break the framework into different modules. For example, let's say we are externalizing the test data and the identifier into an Excel, an Excel file or a spreadsheet. So there would be a class, there would be a module that would be responsible for reading that uh, spreadsheet. There will be another module that would be uh, responsible for execution of the test case. There will be another one that would be responsible for creating uh, reports. Having a modular framework actually make it uh, scalable and adaptable because we are able to update bits and pieces and upgrade bits and pieces without uh, actually collapsing the whole framework on, on itself. That has been uh, that has proved very ha has proved to be very useful at, uh, at at my company right now. So um, that's an important point to have a modular framework. The, the, the next point is um, a strong object identifier. Um, yes, actually this one, um, it's also um, a misconception that uh, XPath or identifiers need to be unique. It's not necessary, it's the way that we handle it, okay? 
but what it needs to, to have is actually the least dependency, dependencies on the other items on the page. Let's take, for example, uh, yes, this one, this XPOF, actually what, what it does is look for, a, for an object having the text Selenium, move to this object, the, the object container, which is the ancestor of that object, moves to that object, and then drill down towards a text, to look for another text, which is called framework. So in this case, what we are looking at the end is for the text framework, okay? But we are navigating through the text Selenium first, and then do its ancestor, and then drilling down to the framework. The problem with this type of XPOF, this is actually an XPOF expression, the problem with this type of XPOF is that we have dependencies on two items. If one of them change, let's say Selenium tomorrow changes, the, the, the capital letter S becomes a small, small letter S, this XPOF is no longer valid then. In that case, we'll need to maintain this uh, XPOF. So having a strong object identifier is important to make sure that we have the least dependencies. Now having it unique is a different, is a different aspect. For example, um, in the framework that I'm going to show you later on, we have one method called repeated click. What it does is click on items repeated, repeatedly. The XPOF will actually describe more than one item. So it's not necessary for the XPOF to be unique, but the way that we handle it is important. So some items, for example, a single click, these items will need to be fed with uh, an XPOF, which is unique, but for other actions like uh, repeated click, they can handle um, multiple, they can handle uh, an XPOF describing multiple objects on the page. The next one is an adaptable framework. Actually, a framework, when it is modular, it becomes easy to change. So it is in line with the first, first point that we have discussed. Unique test data, this is, um, on the long term, actually, this, this might be a problem for automation because it is important to have unique test data. For example, let's say we are creating a user. We are creating a user on a platform. If uh, there is a constraint in the database that the username or the email address of the user need to be uh, unique, if we use the same test data over and over again, <clears throat> it will definitely at some point in time fail. So we have to make sure that we have a unique test data and uh, we, we can develop uh, different methods that we'll discuss later on to, to make sure that we generate those data as well at current time. Right, this is about unique test, uh, unique test data. The next one is about uh, implementation of object synchronization. It is a bad practice actually to use um, static sleep or static pose in, uh, in automation. Why? Because when we are trying to execute the same test on another test environment, the static pose value, the time that we've defined for, for automation to pose and wait for something to happen, may be different, may vary from uh, from one environment to the other. So to allow that environment, we can, we can swap environment uh, easily during testing, we have to find a way to implement a dynamic weight. Uh, something like a weight, uh, like for a small amount of time, and then check again whether it's, it's present, whether the object is, uh, is present on the page. If not, wait a, bit, a little more, then do this looping over and over again till the object doesn't appear. This is about the object synchronization. So it's important to, to put this in place so that we can uh, we, we cut down the dependency that uh, we have on test environment. Failover scenarios, this is also a good thing to have in automation framework. Uh, what we do actually uh, at IGR, we run the automation overnight, okay? We run the automation overnight and then the next day we check for the reports, etc. So just imagine if uh, we are trying to create a user and, and um, a pop-up just appear uh, that is covering the, let's say, the save button, okay? And uh, automation will fail. And subsequently, all the following test cases, the, the test case that follows this specific test case will also fail because we didn't handle that part of pop-up appearing over the um, login button or create button. In this case, 
uh, what we've done, but how we handle the failover scenarios in our, in our end. We've created an action called conditional click that will click on a certain object based on an event or another object appearing. So let's say the automation framework def uh, detects that uh, there is a pop-up that appears. Um, what it will do, it will just simply move and click on the close, uh, on the close icon for the pop-up and continue the test. But nevertheless, there will be one, uh, one step that will still fail to make sure that we investigate why the pop-up appears, if it is a bug or not. Right, this is about the uh, failover scenario. Control execution. Well, um, it will be useless to have a framework if uh, the execution is a control. If there is, for, for each time we are running, we are getting different exception, and the framework in itself is just uh, crashing at, at a certain point in time. We don't have any report to fit and so on. So we can implement a control execution by try, by the try-catch uh, construct to just flag a different uh, uh, exception that we are getting and continue the, the execution and at the end produce a report that will enable uh, further investigation in that sense. Independent test case, yes. Um, it, is, it is a good practice actually to keep test cases uh, independent so that if one test case fails, the others can still execute so one way of implementing uh, uh, test case depend dependencies, uh, uh, test case independencies actually is to implement different actions. For example, skip if found. Um, let's say we, we've, we are trying to create a new account on a platform. The creation part failed, and the next test case that would be executed is actually the, the uh, modification of the, of the created account. So that also will fail. So how we keep these two test cases independent is we do a search, and if the search result bear the, uh, the newly created account name, then it will proceed with, with that test. Otherwise, it will skip it. It will fail still a step for, uh, for further investigation why it wasn't created. But it will skip that test case so that other subsequent tests can still execute. So that's about uh, test case independence. Um, Global configuration, yes. Um, the way of the best way of implementing global uh, configuration is actually to have preconditions to the tests. Uh, that's the way that uh, we do it over here, is to have preconditions. We execute one test case that will go around, search for the test data that is required that is required from the from the database, acquire those, store them in in variables, and then start the execution. This gives a better control and so it also gives um, a, a, significant, a significant cut down in terms of uh, test case, test data maintenance. That's about global configuration. Setup and tear down. Well, uh, when creating uh, an automation framework, there is a module that need to be, that need to be responsible for initializing the browser and uh, giving that browser different uh, desired capabilities and also that module will be responsible for providing a clean exit to the automation. So a clean exit and a clean entry to automation actually will give the automation framework a certain level of stability. And uh, we can define uh, different uh, desired uh, uh, functionalities like uh, to clear the cache before a web driver or a, a browser is initialized, etc. This will give the test a better um, a better um, execution. Right, and uh, yes, separation of this environment for automation. Well, um, it is often not, not, uh, not very obvious to have, but it is recommended to have a specific test environment only for automation. Why? Just to avoid the glitch of having the test team and the automation framework using the same test data or the same users to do certain action on the platform. This is one of the problems that we actually experience when we don't have a separate test environment. Um, right, the, the next point is actually the abstraction of the core framework and the business logic. This will give one uh, fundamental advantage for the framework is that, um, it's, it's about uh, using one automation framework to automate different uh, products. 
let's say uh, one company is actually having is developing multiple products and uh, they won't have an automation framework for each product will be one simple automation one single automation framework that would be customized for that would be actually customized through the test data the externalized uh, test data um, to be used for different products this will also reduce the 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 effect of developing multiple uh, automation framework externalization of test data well abstraction of the business logic is important but keeping with this data as well in a spreadsheet or test uh, text file is also helpful in cutting down the the test data maintenance because this part actually um, manual testers with uh, limited programming skills can still uh, maintain right well like development naming and coding convention is important in automation framework as well because that's that that work is a bit technical so for maintenance for future development and enhancement etc those uh, conventions would be would be handy to have re-execution of logic for failed test cases uh, how we can we can come around is actually we keep um, another module that is responsible for logging all the test cases that fail and then re-executing it at the end when all the test suits are executed so the automation framework keep track of all the tests that fail for execution later on this will reduce the the effort that we need to invest on finding false positive false positives are actually bugs that are flagged as being bugs but are not actually bugs. for example automation framework may flag a functionality that that is not working as a fail but it's not actually a fail maybe there is a loss of of, uh, of connectivity when the test was being run etc but these need to be checked manually so re-execution logic will definitely help in cutting down the manual check that is later required for checking of a false negative right information informative execution report Yes, and what I would expect from an automation framework is actually at the end is a report that helps me drill down to the cause and effect of, uh, of the test. Uh, help me to also reproduce if there is any bug to reproduce it on the test environment manually. How it can help me by providing screenshots for all the failures, by giving uh, like the test, test step on which it was failed, the corresponding uh, test cases, etc. So I would expect those to be in the execution report. Commenting guidelines, like the convention, commenting guidelines help to maintain the framework on the, and uh, implementation of logs in the framework. Well, while the test is being run, it's always good to have a console that will pop up and give you the step and give you the status of, uh, of the test being carried out. Uh, this will help also in, um, in like estimating when the automation run will be completing, etc. and so on. Right, video recording of execution. Again, this will help in in uh, reproducing um, a false positive. A video recording will uh, will show uh, step by step what was done to reach to that uh, to that false positive of bug. Right, and uh, the implementation of CI/CD, continuous integration and continuous deployment. This is where we actually are trying what we are trying to, to implement uh, in the company right now. So uh, we could use automation framework to do the tests once there is a deployment or once there is a commit, we could uh, commit and a compile. Automation framework could automatically be kicked off and run a report, uh, run the test and send a report by email uh, to the team so that uh, they can have a check on the quality of what was deployed or what was committed. So this also um, brings about the concept of early testing, which definitely saves time and money. Right, the last two is actually parallel execution. Parallel execution is a, is a very good way to cut down the execution time. Let's say there is a test where, uh, which is taking two hours. If we run the test, we, we break it into two different test suites. We run it into different machines, it may take half an hour. So we can cut down execution time for parallel execution. We could have uh, an automation framework define it to open two browsers and perform two different uh, test suite concurrently. Um, that's also feasible with, uh, with automation, with uh, Selenium automation framework. And test iteration, well, uh, exhaustive testing is not possible, but uh, we can loop 
uh, on test case itself to cover the maximum uh, permutation combination of test parameters. For example, we could do, uh, let's say we are creating a user again on a platform with different roles, okay? So one role could be a user, another one could be a client or something. Different user, different user role had different uh, access to different, uh, different modules on the platform. So instead of creating one test case for client, one test case for, for a user, one test case for um, uh, another type of user, it is, um, it is more useful actually to create only one test case and loop through it with different test parameters. This is what, uh, what we, we mean by uh, test iteration. And it's not very complex to implement. It's just, it's just that we need uh, a, a good control way a good framework that is robust enough to implement uh, the looping mechanism. Right, so this was about the 22 points I had for the guidelines. I will now um, show you a bit the structure that we have in terms of automation framework at Ikea. So our automation framework is a keyword, keyword driven framework. We extended that concept a little more. We provided more functionalities, more uh, custom, uh, custom develop uh, uh, actions, interactions with the web page. It is one framework which we are using to test multiple products. We have around five to six products that is currently being used uh, by the automation framework to test, to run the test. Um, we also invented or created a pseudo programming language that will help the, uh, the testers with limited programming skills to actually design their own tests and execute it with the compiled version of the framework. So they are they are able to contribute with the with the design in the design process of the test cases. These uh, pseudo programming language allow users to actually create a variable in simple syntax. Create a variable, uh, use that variable, refer that variable, run queries through the automation framework, and so on. By running through queries, this is what we mean by the uh, dynamic data capture. Uh, at the start, we we have defined multiple queries that would be executed. And uh, these, the result of these queries are actually stored in automation token. This is the name we've given to dynamic uh, variables in automation, automation token. And we refer to those automation token. Now and then the test case actually requires it. For example, we are looking for a user of, uh, of a specific role. We run the query, get it automatically done, captured by automation framework and use it. So this, dynamic data capture actually cuts down on the data maintenance and uh, the preconditioned part before executing uh, uh, automation, uh, automation test. <clears throat> so over here, uh, manual tests, manual test team actually help in automation, uh, automation tests. They contribute a lot, they create tests, they create their own tests and they are, they are able to execute the tests as well. And uh, our framework actually support multiple browsers and multiple platform in terms of uh, operating system, Linux, etc. So this is a bit about the automation. The pseudo programming language, this is where we get the most flexibility. Uh, this is something that we've, we've created uh, in-house. This, the pseudo programming language allow the users to create strongly typed variables, retrieve those variables on the long term when they are executing the test, loop over test cases, perform SQL queries, generate random values. For example, let's say we want to create a user with a, with a unique, uh, uh, with a unique uh, username, okay? We could, ha could have the username and a timestamp added, added to it. This could be done through, through the pseudo programming language, which the manual tester will, view, will use to, in, to include in the Excel file for the test data, uh, for the test automation framework to consume. And uh, again, we can define uh, API calls and we are developing, we are still developing more features uh, using this, this pseudo programming language. Right, so this slide actually show um, a block diagram of how our framework works. So we have the team over here, the test team, they are designing the tests in, their, in a spreadsheet and there is a module that reads the spreadsheet and that module actually uh, convey some data to the controller, some data is, is conveyed to the token interpreter. This is uh, what, what I meant actually by, by automation token. These are variables that need to be defined 
before execution is done. And these variables are actually stored in the, in the spreadsheet. And uh, the control is then swapped to uh, the browser controller, which, uh, which is directly connected to the Selenium core, which initializes the browser. And uh, the executor then take over. This part actually executes all the actions that are coded to be done, all the actions that are actually in the Excel. Um, the executor take control over that part and uh, swap the control to, to Selenium for, for it to interact with the browser. At the end, the browser gives feedback to the controller, which after the, the, the test suite is executed, create a report and a console as well, um, so that we can get in real time what is being executed. And uh, at the end as well, the HTML report actually is sent by email to, to the test team so that they can get a status about um, the test that were carried out. So that's basically how the, the framework at IKEA works. So, <clears throat> Selenium and Maven framework. We at IKEA, we've implemented uh, um, a framework based on Java, and we use one, another framework called Maven. We let Maven handle their dependencies. There is, uh, there is a concept of a project object model that's called PUM, XML. Uh, this is where we define actually our dependencies. Each time we, we import the project, there is an uh, independencies. We are flagged, we are, we are notified about those updates and we can choose whether to update it or not. And also if we are we are importing the project from one PC to another, the dependencies are, are downloaded practically using the Maven framework. These two are actually very powerful and they make they they, they shield actually the, the automation tester from a lot of, of, of problem having to configure individual de dependencies, etc. So for me, Selenium and Maven is a good is a good uh, um, mix for for having for, for having on on, a, on an automation framework. And uh, we have multiple browsers, responsive and headless. Headless browsers are actually browsers that are without UI. They are they reside only in in the memory. So these one are actually very helpful when executing uh, automation tests on a command command line machine. For example, we have Linux, which we don't we don't have the UI part for the Linux. We have only the command line. So we, we use headless uh, browsers to run automation over there. Everything is quicker because we don't have the rendering part. We don't have the UI part. Yeah. So we use XPath and XPath access actually to build identifiers. XPath in itself is very complete. We have um, we have the possibility to use class name, ID, etc. So we use an XPath as such to traverse the, the page document object model, the DOM. We use the XPath to, to build identifiers and so on. And it's very, very robust in, in a sense. Right, so automation testing actually is not it's not only limited to testing. I've used automation for other personal items as well, a personal thing, I would say. Um, so I have two examples to share with you how automation framework can be used on a daily basis. The first one would be I've, I had created a page pattern. This one was not, was not actually keyword driven. It was the first one I've tried. I've created a page pattern uh, uh, Selenium framework that would actually download file from hosting services. We have uh, multiple hosting services uh, which provide files for download, movies, documentaries, ebooks, etc. Problem is, uh, once you reach a certain limit of download, it will block your IP. You have to wait for 15 minutes or something. So um, I've used this framework that I've designed to actually continue the download. It will wait for that uh, for that time and then click on download again and so on. Uh, and it was unattended. That it means that I was uh, just launch a program and uh, go to university or go to work or something. It would still run at the end of the day. I would get my files. This is how uh, I started with, autom with automation. And the other one is more interesting. Actually, this this one is not working right now, um, but I have to maintain it. Um, so it's um, it's still a Selenium based uh, page pattern um, project that helped me find the best deal on different shopping platforms. We have eBay, AliExpress, we have Banggood, etc. and so on. So what the framework would do is they will log in onto my account 
on those platforms. They will search for the keyword that I've supplied earlier. They will search for it. They will uh, uh, look for the best deal. They will add the price of the product and the cost of the, uh, the shipping cost. And they will uh, actually key, do, do some comparison. And at the end, it will compile the best deal that I can get from, from different shops and send it to me by an SMS through one, one uh, uh, API I've, I've used is Twilio. It's, uh, it's very user friendly to use. So uh, it will send me an SMS and I get a short list of the, uh, links of, of deals that I can buy. And I, just, I can just click on those links and buy it. So these, these two actually used to save me hours uh, daily. But it did take some time actually to, to go them and to implement them in place. Right, so last few words about building an automation framework. Well, innovation in automation is continuous. We have uh, so many tools now. Selenium is still the most popular. Uh, we have, uh, but there are other tools that are gaining, gaining in popularity. For example, we have Catalan Studio. But uh, we have to know that Catalan Studio is still based on, on Selenium. So they are using the same Selenium API behind. So uh, innovation in, in, in the sense of uh, automation, building an automation framework needs time and space. How we built our framework over here, we tried first, we failed, we learned from, from our failure, we tried again and we succeeded. This is the way that we build our performance test automation framework as well. We have another framework. Maybe this one would be a different talk for next year. And we have, uh, it's, it's very important to have the whiteboarding session. Actually, most of, uh, of the time, when we have to develop a feature, you will see that me and my team sitting here yeah, the whiteboard trying to, to draw block diagrams, etc. to have to come up with the best design that would, we could implement. The problem with, with uh, having an externalized um, automation framework, like having a keyword driven, have the test data and actions and uh, test uh, um, test data actions and identifiers outside the code is to have the mapping done. For example, we have we we, we want to to allow the framework to do um, API calls. We need to know how to map the parameters required for the API call onto the Excel, so that it is open to to manual testers to use. And this is the most uh, complex part once we have a mature automation framework. And uh, the last one is actually a principle to open automation to everyone, is actually to handle the complexity of features within the framework and not have it um, passed on onto, onto the manual test team because they already have uh, quite some tests to do and they are designing automation tests as well. So we handle all the complexities within the framework in terms of uh, adding complexities on our code, but make it more easier for uh, the users of the framework uh, to configure and use the framework as such. All right, so um, let me check. I will, can still show you um, a small demo about our framework. Um, so this is the framework that we use. I've designed a test case for Facebook, actually, it will go on Facebook and we'll, we'll simply try to, to verify the login page. Okay, it will go on the IKEA Facebook page and uh, then uh, try to log in from there and verify that page. I've created two test cases the same way. Uh, the first one will pause, the second one, I've, I've uh, created some dummy um, XPOF. Okay, let me, let me show you the console as well. Help. To follow. There we go. Okay, so it started. It's trying to validate the different page, and there we go. Over here, you will see that there is a failure. So we get a status about which test case, which test step passed, which one failed. In the seventh step in the test case two, actually I've created a dummy XPath. So this one is failing, but the, but the framework is trying to do is to check whether that XPath still is present. So we'll fail and it will create a report. Give me the stack trace as well. Here it is, here is the failure, right? And it will give me the stack trace. It is trying to zip and send me the, send me the report. So the test case was designed over here. This is my test data sheet, okay? 
So we have the test suite. We define where the test, where which test will be executed. We have the different test cases as well over here. So you will see um, verify element present. There it is. So the export is not valid because the valid one is current password. The invalid one is current passwords with S. So this this step will fail, and uh, it generated a report is as well for me. Here it is in uh, there is my drive. There we go. Test result. I'll sort it with the latest one. There we go. Here it is. So that's the report that was generated. Okay will give me in terms of test cases, in, term, in terms of test step, and then I can drill down. There it is. The first one passed. The first test case passed. The second one failed. I can click on the screenshot, and it tells me where, where it failed. Right, so um, that's pretty much what I had about how to build um, an automation framework which is robust and flexible at the same time. And uh, definitely will, it will help uh, in cutting down the effort for the manual testing. So I'm open to your questions. If you have any, I would be glad to answer, answer you. Hey, Lovelace. Hey. That was a very hey. nice presentation. Yes, indeed. Yeah, I had to rush a bit a little at the end, <laughs> but uh, I think I managed it within the time. No, it's good. I mean, the the, the Important bits were there. Um, we got to see the a bit of the code. We got to see the reporting, which is which is really nice, because um, that's kind of one of the. Again, I may be outdated here, but that's kind <laughs> of one of the um, uh, drawbacks. Not really drawbacks, but weak points rather of Selenium mm -hmm. that it's, it doesn't have that inbuilt reporting. So it uses external third-party reporting tools, JUnit, and and so on. I may be mistaken. Am I? Yeah, so um, normally Selenium relies on third-party um, uh, third party providers for reporting capabilities, right? Like yes. JUnit and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's nice to see that even in the demo, you showed off how it, it was able to do the report. Yes, um, but actually the report, we created it in-house as well because uh, we didn't want to have too much dependencies on, on external, on external uh, libraries. Yeah. So we yeah. created our reports. And we wanted our report to be like uh, in a certain fashion, to be presented in a certain fashion, and uh, with uh, with JUnit, et cetera, with the, the existing library for report, we don't have much customization as, as such, which is possible. This this makes me smile because <laughs> this is kind of the point. Uh, it's not a bug; it's a feature. So you can look <laughs> at the, the lack of reporting in build or something as a weak point, or you can look at it as adaptability where you can use it however you want. So that's, exactly. that's actually a nice take on it. Um, so yeah, we've, we've had some fans in the, in the live chat um, complimenting your session. Uh, and you got it right, some here. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you. one of the best comments I saw right now, it's from Shervin Bu. So fail fast and learn faster. Yeah, that's kind, of, <laughs> yeah. that's kind of the spirit behind um, all testing, actually. Um, sure. Yeah, that was a really great session. I actually look forward to, to trying out Selenium. Someone just mentioned Java in the comments, uh, in the chat. Now, I won't try it with Java. I'll probably try it with C Sharp, Selenium Web Driver ah, or something. Right. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Selenium is compatible with C Sharp, with Java, with Groovy, with Python. It's a very exactly. open engine, actually. Yeah, this, yeah, this is one of the things so I, I, I mentioned um, in the chat. Uh, it's one of the very few offerings that is open source. It's free yes. and it's free. It can play right on the playground of paid alternatives. It can compete with them. So this For is the like last 15 years, actually, Selenium is the, is the market leader in terms of automation. It was founded yeah. in 2004 and for 16 years, it had been the leader in the automation. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's not something to... Um, to just disregard it's it works and that's why and it has some some obvious advantages even business wise so yes. it makes all the sense um all right so thank you very much for this great session my, uh, pleasure. my pleasure thank you so much thanks uh, do you want up. to leave some closing comments for the crowd before we um ah. we end the session 
Sure. Actually, um, yeah, like, like you said, actually, the learning process is actually failing first. So uh, even when I started with, with automation, I, uh, automation and performance, actually, we, we built all both, both framework uh, in-house. So we failed quite a lot. We, we learned from our failure and then we built it in a better way. So it's just taking a few steps back and then jumping right over the target. Right. So yeah. that's that's what I had to say at the end. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> that's a nice yeah. That's a nice motto to, to, to leave for the for the week. <laughs> well I with that need to we can write it then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. Uh, with that, we can conclude this session. Um, thank you for being yeah. here. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Uh, have a great evening. Same to you. Take care. Bye. Bye, Hamlesh. Vidush. So that, was, that was day How two. How was your day? <laughs> yes. Mine was, mine was okay. I mean, I have a co-host with me who's like, a, it's hard to manage, but, um, you know, I'm... I'm <laughs> Are you I'm saying I'm okay. the one who's hard to manage? So, how was your day? <laughs> I, I think it was really good. We had like some very nice speakers. Okay, some very interesting session I didn't understand, but they sounded really interesting. So, we, yeah, I think we did we good. Gonna, we're going to turn you into a techie, a geek, you know, by the end of day three. It's okay. It's going to happen. You're, you're getting yeah. there. You're, yeah. You know the keywords, testing, selenium, next. You know next now. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Yeah. Um, With that, yeah. Um, guys, I think we are going to conclude this session. Do you guys want to chat with us? We are going to we are going to give you a few seconds to send us some some good vibes in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even sure if there's anyone. One of them replied eh, the, the last time when I said no one's saying hi. Someone said hi. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm optimistic. Okay, Someone's let's gonna wait for a few seconds then. You guys make our day. Just send a little yes. hi or something. Like, literally, they make our day. We we are hosting <laughs> <laughs> for um for everyone watching. Now I don't think it's gonna happen. It's late and the session just ended. So I think everyone yeah. is um the day. Let's do that too. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, guys, for watching. We hope to see you tomorrow. We will. They they are I they are very will. They're very dedicated. <laughs> ah, Nichenzo, hey, Nichenzo. hi or something, hi something. Nichenzo. Dude, you're the man. I had hope. Hey. <laughs> right. So I know you Thank said hi. You're about to say bye. Though. So. <laughs> bye, Nichenzo. Come bye. see us tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Bye, everyone.